it feels like we keep a lot of our information, the studies, field work to us. And we've got to remember that universities are highly elite places, especially Russia Group University. So where does the public feature in any of that? Like, where do we engage them? How do we create a space where we're working collaboratively as a commu collaboratively as a community? And I just don't see that happening very much. I'm, it might do, but I just don't see it like who gets to produce the knowledge being distributed or diversified um, beyond the university walls. And therefore we don't get diverse conservationists. conservationists. We don't get um, young people from lower income backgrounds learning about these things. We need everyone to know about these things. these pink flowers which is thyme on this lovely limestone grassland and I'm looking for the eggs of the large blue which are laid on these flower buds and I'm seeing other interesting things I found a yellowy egg on a grass stem but it's not a large blue egg I'm just amazed that you can see this. Where did you get these special powers? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, obviously it's just sort of a thing to, to look closely and uh, we don't tend to do much of that in our busy lives to actually stop and peer at something. But I find I need to peer with a purpose. So I need to be looking for something or else I just don't look. And I guess that's the same with everyone. So my interest and love for this butterfly drives me to look. So I guess I should thank the butterfly for that. <laughs> But yeah, it's got to, I've got to a stage of my life now where I need to take my glasses off to look closely at things. Yeah. So it's the look of middle age, isn't it? It is. Can I join you? No, please do. I was just trying to see if I could find some eggs on this time, but I can't. Oh, I don't know if it's my failing eyesight or just we're still a bit early to find the eggs. And how, be... how small are we talking, Patrick? Would it just be a little speck of white? Or... Yeah, yeah, basically a speck of white. And But, you know, it sort of looks egg shaped and some of the little tiny buds can look or where the flowers used to be can look a bit bit like that but um, I mean, you can see it with your naked eye if it's there i think that might be one
Aurelian called Matthew Oates, who some of you may have heard him on the radio, he's, he's written a book or two, and um, he studied the Romantic poets but got into butterfly science. And he kind of says that um, the world is too, the natural world around us, or the world of other species, is just too amazingly overwhelming. And there's so much of it that you have to focus on one thing within the landscape. And, and that's your sort of um, gateway drug into, into these kind of wider experiences. And, and so you sort of narrow down your focus and then it comes out again and, and maybe inspires you to act uh, more broadly in and uh, not just in a sort of myopic way but in a um in a, in a broader way um in culture butterfly obsessives have often been used as in a, as a kind of metaphor for myopia and there's a um enid blyton story five go to billy cock hill where the where the butterfly <laughs> collectors are so are these strange men and they're so enthralled to their obsession heads down that they don't see the criminal activity going on <laughs> around. Right. So, yeah. I'm, I'm buying that. <laughs> Love is like a butterfly. <laughs> Little patch of England laid out for us. Yeah, well, I can say, I was, when Simon said, oh, do you fancy this last week? I said, I've got a day out of London in the country. Yeah, why not? <laughs> what, what's not to like? <laughs> Particularly looking for a parasitic <laughs> cuckoo butterfly, I mean. <laughs> okay, so I'm sat on Collard Hill in Somerset, looking out at a beautiful landscape and catching the occasional large blue at a time when you least expect it. We got it. Bugs especially. I dare not move. Oh my god. It's drinking from That's the what fire, any right? ecological story in, immediately reveals connectedness. Like the, the story you told in the Star Patrick, it's a story about mm -hmm. interconnectedness. And maybe that's why yeah, Timothy so. Morton, the ecology that I can share, is called an American. I think what we're doing right now is degrowth to take a moment. Can you just describe what's happening? Yeah, so we see a large blue butterfly. It's really tiny and it's set on top of a flower that I cannot identify. Um, you know, so I think drinking and it's just beautifully moving its wings. Oh, and that's flying away. Oh my god. That was amazing. Are we just playing God with one species? Is this a vanity project? Is this just, Simon says, eco-bling? Um, what, what relevance does this have to the extinction crisis? Does it um, save more than one species? Is it just making us feel good about ourselves? Who has a right to do this? Should only conservation scientists who, who study it for years and years and make publicly available all their data, should only they have a right to do this? Or should random people like you or I have a right to do this and, and chuck out butterflies? My, I, I work three days a week for The Guardian writing about nature and I, I wrote a news story this week about um, um, Aurelians who are doing just this, um, doing their own reintroductions, inspired by stories like this one, but doing their own um, guerrilla reintroductions without necessarily um, sharing data or, or knowledge. Um, is, is that allowed? Is that where we should be? At? We should we all be acting? Should we all be becoming introductionists? Is, is what is what we call them.
charge her more time. Exactly this time, yeah. We might try and find it. Like that's something wondrous, but they don't. They're they're so surrounded by other problems in the city, they don't have this appreciation. Now, who's going to be the next generation of conservationists? Who's going to be the next generation of? Sorry, I can't say that name that you say that are. But, or yeah, butterfly obsessors. Like, who's going to be the next generation of those? Because if you if you you say that they're older, more uh, mature people, okay, but who's going to replace those older, more mature people? In my opinion, it's like how do we how have we created this structure that only certain people do get involved in the conversation and certain people feel excluded from the conversation? Like I grew up in London, and you say that nature is our common language or commonality, but I don't feel like it is. I grew up around a concrete jungle. Like I didn't, I don't feel like nature was me. I've had to force myself to love nature. And I think that it speaks to some of the, the questions that we've had about who controls the access, the knowledge, the decision making around natural spaces, uh, whether they be in these kind of rural places or within inner cities. And, and I think also it's about understanding that people have different knowledge positions. So when we saw the large bloom, I asked somebody, was this the actual large blue? But actually, did that really matter? Because I'd seen this butterfly up close and, and engaged with it and looked closely at it. So there's different ways of knowing in that space. I think that's what Lara is also trying to sort of convey there. I'm fed up with human beings uh, attacking insects and, <laughs> and ruining our ha habitat, um, bringing over yet another Nordic invasion. Yeah, <laughs> and so, so it's like the red squirrel all over again, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I did see some relatives. Um, they were, <laughs> they were understandably disturbed by the. Uh, 14 go crazy in uh, in, in Wiltshire, um, if, although we're not in Wiltshire, I don't believe that. Somerset. Somerset, thank Somerset. you. Um, no, it, it's just, I was talking to John, um, and it, what was really nice is kind of just being out, out in nature, and it reminded me of being a boy and just sort of, you know, climbing a tree or being under a tree and just kind of sitting there and daydreaming and... It's, it's lovely, particularly when you live in a, in a city or in an urban sort of environment. It's just kind of nice to have some fresh air and, and be, um, be attacked by nature uh, rather than the other way around. place but it's clearly a place that's been left behind and failed by capitalism and by what's happened and by developments and it's a it's a failed place isn't it it's a sort of one of those interesting yeah. kind of places yeah, it's, you know. um, I know a colleague of mine I only know about this through his work uh, stranded assets yeah the, 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 this idea that's one of the kind of big issues about moving towards a post-carbon future is what to do with all of the infrastructure and all of the carbon that remains in the ground and most importantly of all all of the pension fund investment that there is in um, oil and fossil fuel companies you know that, that there's, there's a huge issue in kind of um, investment markets uh, around pension funds who are like some of the biggest investors looking to de-risk uh, by kind of disinvesting in fossil fuels and theref therefore kind of creating this kind of stranded asset problem as I understand it 
we have all of this kind of pipelines, infrastructure, petrol stations, you name it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is thereby kind of left sort of um, valueless. That there were words kind of like value, certainly yeah. monetary value has has gone. think about nature as invasive and when we're human beings I mean I, I think that's a bit rich <laughs> we are nature really yes. Yes. Currently, as well as the geological landscape, you've got the current biological landscape here. So looking out on the point here, it's a really important place for migratory birds and overwintering birds. So you have lovely populations of short-eared owls around. There's the islands, there's the um, now virtually extinct elver fishing yeah. industry, which is an interesting story, and the fact that the eels have disappeared due to people probably again. Um, so you've got the bird populations, you've got the uh, interesting fish populations, uh, the fact that people don't like the mud, but it's absolutely crucial to the ecosystem as it stands now, but how will it be in the future? The exploitation of resources will still continue unless we Definitely. have a completely different system, a post capitalist system. Yeah. Post carbon is not going to. There's going to be another thing to, to rip that I can exploit. I think, we, I think for me, I, I would use it as the space as a place to um, a rewilding centre. Which includes dream, dreaming places to have a, a dream, a dream temple. Seeing out in various ways, uh, it could also be like a sort of a thought about this, like a holy kind of place, because it's got all of these kind of amazing structures: the bridge, the building itself, the electricity pylons, the motorway. In a, in a kind of post-apocalyptic future, you think, well, who built these things? They must have been gods. <laughs> well, the gods have now departed and gone elsewhere, and so this becomes like a sort of um, pilgrimage site almost to kind of witness this kind of lost civilization. These are called weeds often. And there's a lot of um, medicinal properties there, there's a lot of histories, cultures, ways of being and living. They're all quite different to each other, but they're living together on the site. And I mean, my idea is that we need to listen to what's here. Amphitheater in here, so we'd rip up the concrete, we'd put more of a porous, um, porous surface. surface down, and um, there'll be an amphitheater. There would also be some other spaces which we'd use as a market. All of this would be topped with solar panels because it would help keep it cooler. Um, but we'd also, you will also notice there are turbines in the seven because we thought by then 
they will be harnessing that kind of power. We talked about wind turbines and then we got talking about the sound and actually it, the surface noise. Do we, do we need, I think when we were talking about the butterfly, we were talking about does, does beauty mean that we end up saving the beautiful things? And that's what we're talking about here, aren't mm -hmm. we? We're talking about this is a, a used to be or a, a, a site of, of natural beauty, a, a viewpoint for people to stop on their mm -hmm. journey to see. And what we're imagining here is how we kind of somehow resurrect that beauty um, through imagining an alternative kind of use and, and for this space. So I think it, it comes back to those ideas of what needs protecting and how do we make those decisions about the spaces, species that, that, that need attention. Extinction isn't like a problem that you solve. It's not like a technical problem. For, for me, it's more like a cultural reckoning with, um, we're in a predicament and it, it needs something more than a technical fix. It needs a whole cultural rewilding slash revolution. And for that to happen, we need to think about our economies, our political institutions.